games are too, excuse my French, gosh darn big. Developers strive for massive open spaces, which is really cool that modern day technology can pull off feats like this. But when it comes to putting actual content into this barren wasteland of planes and trees, ah, that's when we see these games lacking. Now that we're into the 2020s and we've had well over a decade of the gaming industry being dominated by open world games, we can clearly see that developers have begun focusing too much on the open that they've forgotten about the world. Let's try to figure out where it began and work our way up. Although there were technically open world games before it, Ali was really the first open world game in 1984. If you don't recognize it, the game has been modernized into Elite Dangerous, which is known for being a one-to-one -one recreation of the entire Milky Way galaxy. If that isn't too big, I don't know what is. Uh, can I get that with soy milk, please? Elite back then, however, was pretty straightforward and was more of a space trading simulator rather than a game that prioritizes exploration. There's definitely an argument there, but this is a video you're watching and I can't read the comments until after it's finished, so I don't give it to. <laughs> Instead, we're gonna focus on Highlight and no, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Which was actually launched the same year as Elite 1984, just like a little later. Highlight was a fantasy game through and through. Your goal was to save fairies, who were actually pieces of a princess, to kill an evil wizard and save the world or something or other, it doesn't matter. Point is that the game had optional areas with items and lore that could help you on your journey, rewarding the player for exploration, which to my knowledge was the first time that's ever been done, but to be honest, this topic is incredibly hard to research and I could be wrong, but once again, I don't give a toot. The Legend of Zelda and Ultima then took what Highlight, Lee, and many others were doing and popularized it, making them the foundation for what the open world genre would become. Basically, every N64 game is some level of open world, technically open zone since each segment is closed off from the others, but Grand Theft Auto 3 is really the next time we can see the genre morph into something entirely new. GTA 3 honored its predecessors in a unique way, being called Elite but in a city, and Zelda meets Goodfellas. It sets the bar for all open world games after by becoming more sandboxy, which means it allows players to creatively interact with the world around them, solving puzzles with methods not always predetermined by the developers. However, once again, like Elite, it doesn't really fit the point of the video. We're not talking open world games in general. I already made a video about that and all of you certainly have watched it already, right? 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 Instead, a game that would better fit the topic of this video would be Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Bethesda's new open world game in 2006 developed well after GTA 3 changed the genre drastically. A game universally praised for its innovation in the gaming space and often criticized for its repetitive dungeons and caves. But I haven't played it. So instead, we're gonna jump a decade after GTA 3 and talk about Skyrim, where clearly they would have learned from their errors with Oblivion and make a smaller open world with less repetition, right? 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 Skyrim showed off a massive open world, one of the biggest of the time. Well, if you ignore a couple, oh my god. Okay, one of the biggest in the RPG genre. Skyrim was a groundbreaking game at the time, and has since become a building block for every open world game after, with many modern day games citing it as their primary inspiration. For many, including myself, it was a gateway into an amazing world full of fantastic characters and stories and a combat system that made many fall in love. I could quit anytime I want. My favorite innovation that people point to is the mountain. No matter where you are in the world, it's always visible. So you can easily place yourself in the environment. Now technically Obsidian did it first with New Vegas, but we're not talking about that game. We're talking about Skyrim. I don't give a toot. <laughs> While Scaly Mario's Mountain is an amazing innovation, at the end of the day, it's just one point of the map. The mountain becomes pointless if what it overlooks doesn't matter. So outside of the amazing towns, which are pretty unique, what's left is a lot of empty space and 197 dungeons. Now we're using the term dungeon loosely, similar to your mom. <laughs> So this includes caves, tombs, and really anything that can be cleared by Skyrim standards, which means it has enemies, puzzles, and often a boss of some kind. Now some of the dungeons are unique one-offs, or really just done a few times, which I would consider fun, so let's just ignore anything done under a generous five times. That knocks off 20, so 177 to go, all within these categories. Well, let's just single one of them out. There are 41 Nordic tombs across the map. In each and every one of those, you fight nearly the exact same Draugr, encounter the exact same puzzles, and see the same traps, ah! and usually fight the exact same boss, all with very little variation. Every single one of these categories are like that. Now, after exploring a tomb once, it's pretty unique, S scary, even. The second time, it's still kind of scary, 
the seventh, now they're just dusty rooms. <laughs> we as humans, well, most of us anyway, have evolved to be infinitely curious about everything. That birth is a hunger for exploration and discovery. I know, I've played Civ, you always build the scout first. I'm basically an expert. Usually, the exploration only feels worthwhile if it ends with some sort of discovery. Each of these will give your brain a shot of dopamine, which makes the journey before feel worth it no matter how long it was. However, when you get one of these rewards a second time, all of the sudden, that exploration and the first one feel much less special, even if it does have better stats. It's the same story for the inverse. If you went through a dungeon that was exactly the same as a different dungeon, but it ended with a super cool boss fight, the dungeon becomes a slog, plus it makes the rest of the dungeons feel like a job, because you just want what's at the end, but not the lead up. It's a whole thing. This includes repetitive mini games that result in unique rewards. Same thing, different coat of paint. The exception to all of that is when the game is actively telling you not to do it, pushing you away from the repetition be it because of a goof of it being infinitely long or a big reward at the end. However, that reward better not be an achievement. Don't make me do that for the platinum. I'm looking at you, Everhood! Regardless, repeats lessen experiences. Fighting the first big daddy in Bioshock is terrifying. The second one, a little less so, so on and so forth until it's just a challenge. Palaces in Breath of the Wild are super cool and super difficult the first time. But then as you play, they just become normal risks with variations that don't really matter that much. Still the same monster. Outside of the adventure genre, horror games are a prime example of repetition lessering effect. The first time you meet a monster in a horror game, the entire lead up to it is horrifying. And the initial interaction, even more so. <laughs> but afterward, the horror starts to go away because you know what's hunting you. And eventually, you know how it works. Oh, hey, Jeff. Roguelike games are a good example of repetition done well. They're built around player improvement. Meanwhile, open world games are filled with repetition just to fill the empty space. But repetition can't fill the void in my heart. It all comes down to intent. Now, Skyrim gets a lot of crap nowadays, and a lot of it is just earned. Bethesda hasn't done a great job of treating their fans with respect. But back then, it was praised, and once again, is still cited as inspiration for many modern games, which might explain the repetitive nature of said modern games. Back then, limitation in current technology was a big excuse. The devs could only do so much. But today, however, they don't have the same excuse. And yet they're still making big empty deserts. But that's not new to Skyrim. Technology has always been a huge limiting factor in video games, including highlight. But it's also been a huge source of creativity. It's caused developers to look for workarounds and alternatives to meet the needs of both the technology and their creative vision. This same technology has slowly allowed developers to pursue much larger, more complex games with less loading screens. But I think a different limitation is holding back devs more nowadays employee bandwidth. The employees simply don't have enough time to create everything that these big open worlds demand, and hiring more and more employees isn't seeming to help the issue from my point of view. Because of this limitation, AI tools have become available like procedural generation, which can be used to randomly place defined assets into the game with rules set out by the developers. This has been done in interesting ways like Left 4 Dead with enemy spawns or environmental effects that change up the difficulty depending on how well the players are doing. Foliage like in Unreal 5, dungeons in Diablo, or entire worlds like Minecraft. However, these experiences built by the computer usually aren't as great as ones made by a person. They lack creative control and often are just Lego bricks on an empty green slab. They're not very good at their job, which is why AI art looks like shit no matter how much it steals. But when used as an assistance tool rather than the entire mechanic, it allows developers to flesh out these massive worlds. However, once again, Usually, this results in a lot of repetition in environments and makes everything a little samey. To counteract this, waypoints come into play. The upside, players know where to go. The downside, you spoil exploration by guiding a player directly there instead of allowing them to find their own path. It takes the fun out of exploration and instead makes it a to-do list, which is a different kind of fun. Towers became a game design crutch for this same issue. And although there are many examples of them done poorly, we can also observe a couple examples of them done 
done really well, where they strictly give a player a vantage point, but don't tell them the things they can do on the map. Oh, this is high. All of these things, plus stuff like the mountain in Skyrim, are tools to help the player navigate an open world full of empty space in between repetitive tasks and rewards. Freedom of movement doesn't equal freedom of exploration. Now, usually with these videos, I like to bring a solution that we, the gamers, can push for, or at the very least, give an example of something that I think does the topic well and should be an example for others. But this time, I'm gonna be real, I don't think there's anything we can do. There's no way for us to tell the game developers or publishers what we want, no way for us to vote with our wallet, and no example to push their way. We might just be out of luck. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm making this video for the wrong person. Maybe I shouldn't be prioritizing the gamers this time, but instead push the video to the developers directly. Gamers, this video is no longer for you. Leave a like on your way out. Developers, we need games to be smaller. The massive open worlds that are one to one to real life or even bigger are amazing on paper. And I won't lie to you, they're good buzzwords too. But in practice, they're taking up more dev time and wasting player time. If you can't fill the world you've created with unique content, then the world is too big. Instead of building the world and then popularizing it with things to do, make the things and then create fun variants of them and then build the world to house them and then write reasons for them existing after with, you know, little tweaks here and there. Don't stray from reusing content entirely, but don't reuse rewards and limit yourself depending on what you're reusing. Basically, if you're at a point where procedural generation is something you're relying on for anything other than clutter like trees or trash, you might be going too far. Now I do want to preface, I'm not a game developer. Y'all could be doing this already. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just a nerd on the internet. I look at me. You're not my usual demographic. It's those things. But I still feel like all of this could be done better and frankly, I'm getting sick of it. Not every game needs to be a small experience like I'm trying to sell here, but don't be afraid of making them either. Hi-Fi Rush or Miles Morales proves that it can work. Shorter experiences are an excellent opportunity to try something new and give a break before the next massive game. Really, at the end of the day, regardless of this whole fucking video, all I'm really saying is I don't want to fight this guy 20 times or this guy twice since the first time was extremely lessened by the second and the first time was really cool. And I don't want to explore the same dungeons 20 times either. Even if it ends with that guy, I don't want to do it. Make things unique so they feel special. And also just like a little side thing, stop spoiling exploration for people by telling them exactly what's in a spot. Let them find out themselves. But that doesn't work if you're like Cyberpunk where the question marks a lot of the time were just repetitive busy quests but also the big story quest so you had to go to all of them to figure out which one was which. It was a whole thing, I hate it. If I wanted repetition, I would go to work. I don't want that out of my video games. At least not all the time. Some is a little good, but not all the time. Without this repetition, many games wouldn't be hundreds of hours long with tons of fluff. Which is the reason I don't end up playing a lot of games when I'm not sure if I'll be into the gameplay. Like Persona 5, for example. I don't want to experiment with a 100 hour game, even if it could end up being my favorite. I'll just never know. It goes beyond Persona 5 with a lot of games sharing the same story and often it's a turn-based game by a Japanese developer, which makes me feel like I'm being lumped in with the people who harass these developers for the same issues. People who I very much don't want to be in the same camp of. People you can learn about in this video right here. I do plan to play Persona 5 and uh, these other games eventually despite my hesitancy, but because Persona 5 is so long, I don't know if I ever will. Regardless, I won't be calling them JRPGs for the reasons in that video right there. Thank you for watching this video though. I love you. Mwah!